Hello, good evening and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us um, in this uh, live stream panel discussion. Um, as you probably know, as you can see down below, I'm Susie from Design Anthology. And it's been a real pleasure for us to partner with the Design Singapore Council on their groundbreaking Visions of the Future exhibition. The exhibition has been running since December last year and had a physical and an online component. So tonight's talk is entitled, How Can Design Change Behaviour? And as the title suggests, it's going to be a discussion very much around behavioural design. And I think we're going to be touching on some really interesting topics. Uh, joining me tonight on the panel, um, our guest speakers, uh, first of all, two young designers who are dialing in from Singapore, and that is Po Yun Ru and Kevin Chiam. And their work is part of the Visions of the Future exhibition. And the two of them, uh, their work that is part of the exhibition very much addresses human behaviour and their designs um, are addressing different issues in relation to that. Um, joining Kevin and Yun Ru tonight is uh, Fiona Meehan, who's a registered psychologist and the Chief Innovation Director of Make Studio, who's uh, also in Melbourne, and Li Fu, who is the Executive Director and partner of uh, UV Architecture, and he's based in Shenzhen. So thank you all for joining me. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's get started. I think for those of you who are watching, there is an opportunity to type in questions. So please do that. We'll have, uh, I think, a little bit of time at the end for a QA. and um, and we'd love to hear some questions from you. So let's get started. Um, my first question, which is directed at each of you, uh, is about the role of design in creating positive change, specifically behavioural change in the world. And, and how, if at all, do we see that change? Over to you, Fiona. I, th I think that um, design has a huge potential um, to change um, or influence behaviour. Um, and I guess the key word is about influencing behaviour positive, for positive change rather than making the behaviour change itself. So I think um, if you think about behavioural design, it's about creating a choice architecture um, that will help people make change. And um, already there's a lot of examples of where um, behavioural design is doing that. So, for example, um, if you, um, for countries that opt in for organ donation, um, there's a whole heap more people that will actually um, actually will um, donate their organs than for countries where you have to actually opt in to donate organs, um, embedding affordances in designs. Um, if you're thinking about um, re um, sustainability behaviours, um, there's lots of gamifications you can do, having clear rubbish bins, all of those sorts of things. There's a whole heap of really positive things that you can do and, and design has a huge role to play there. Um, but I think moving forward in the future, because um, design also has the potential to um, create not so positive behaviour, there's going to be a lot more um, emphasis on how um, how we actually look at the role of the designer in creating the change. So the shift will be on um, making sure that the designers are, are really clear on, you know, what positive design and positive change actually means, that people have the choices to make the changes that, that we're looking for, um, and, and it's, it's done in an ethical way. Thanks, Fiona. There's um, a lot of really great touch points there. Um, Li Fu, I might ask you to follow up on that, um, given your background in architecture. Um, what role do you think design plays in, in creating positive change? My point is that uh, design of behaviour has been a critical um, creator of our culture, uh, of any cultures, uh, especially like China is a long with a really long history, uh, whether you realize it or not, a lot of our behavior were designed uh, for thousands of years. For example, like the Confucius teaching, uh, when you first enroll your school, you have to bow to your teachers and uh, you have to show your respect to the, um, 
to the Confucius teaching, and that kind of thing is actually uh, definitely helping the society to pay a lot of more attention to education and uh, give the teachers a really high status in the society. Uh, I think the by just bowing to the teacher, uh, the, this is a very long tradition of the society. I think it is a good example of how this behavior design uh, can shape a culture. I think the uh, similar um, idea uh, can actually be used in a lot of the future uh, society to improve uh, whatever uh, the, the, the value uh, should be put at. Uh, so that'll, that'll be my uh, point. But what it is, uh, is for our uh, future discussion. I think, uh, I think you've raised some really interesting points there. Thank you. Um, I think let's ask uh, Yun Ru, what do you see as the role of design um, in creating positive change in the future? So I think for me, um, the role of design here is more to help understand, empathize and complement existing user behavior. So for example, project that was showcased in the vision of the future exhibition um, my project in this case, um, it was not really designed to drastically change the behavior of my user, but rather tapping on fond memories or experiences and instinctive behavior to trigger their memory. If we can perhaps go to um, Kevin about your thoughts on the role of design in creating positive change. And translate weak signals or cues into tangible nudges that eventually challenge our mental schemas in order to set a change in views or perspective. So this eventually lays out the foundation to change the way people think, feel, or act, of course, in a positive way. Now, while the strategies and methodologies we employ may change, depending on the circumstance, uh, I doubt that the role of design would change in the future, simply because design is a way of uh, thinking, it's a frame of mind that creatively interprets the situation, the context, before suggesting an appropriate form of action. I'd love for each of you to talk a bit about your work and a recent project. And for uh, Kevin and Yunru, that would be the work that's in the Visions of the Future exhibition. Um, and to talk a bit about how you've tried to shape or change uh, normal human behavior via design. A majority of my work focuses on people and behavior change. So in the recent exhibition, I designed a collection of probes focusing on two areas. Uh, first is safety and second is hygiene, with of course the second theme being more pronounced in a pandemic. Now, uh, the first one, which is safety, uh, I designed sort of a complementary fire alarm system. It's called ECHO and leverages on the tension derived from a very large inflating balloon to drive action and to facilitate path or wayfinding. Now, this is because I realized through research that fire deaths are often due to inaction rather than panic. So this is the first project. The second project looks into how we unconsciously touch bases um, generally between 20 to 30 times in a single hour and in fact, this ritual actually gives germs and bacteria a free ride into our bodies. So to combat or to think about that, I designed uh, a piece of jewelry titled uh, Odor. It is a ring that uses our natural response to bad odor to discourage us from touching our faces. Now, once you twist the ring apart, you, it reveals a lightly saturated ammonium sulfide core, which is associated with uh, bad eggs, for example. And it is only detectable within range when you draw your hand near to your face. Um, so therefore, when we draw our hands to our close to our face, our instinct will tell us to keep our hands clear. Now, in the last design, uh, we understand that hand wash can be counterintuitive to children, considering the fact that they spend more time getting it dirty. So the question that I had was, how then can we encourage them to do so? And therefore, um, I've designed soap tattoos 
right, which is essentially a set of stickers with a soap facade hiding a graphic motif that reveals itself only when children apply water. And in doing so, they get to wash their hands. Uh, fundamentally, it appeals to the children's sense of curiosity and wonder. Thanks, Kevin. There's, yeah, there's some really interesting uh, behaviours through there, which I think is really interesting. So I'm curious to know, Kevin, what do you think, um, as a designer, how deep of an understanding of psychology do you think designers need to have um, when, when sort of pursuing a career in industrial design? Do you think it's really fundamental or do you think it depends on um, the, the kinds of issues that you're hoping to address in your work? Well, frankly speaking, uh, I would say perhaps just deep enough. So allow me to explain, right? So unlike psychologists or psychiatrists, who have both breadth and depth of knowledge in behavior, in biology, and the human psyche. Designers, on the other hand, delve deep within a particular area, depending on the topic of interest and the project that they undertake. So for example, if we are trying to help children with ADHD, we try to understand the factors or the stimulus that affect their attention span. So with that said, of course, it would not hurt to have a basic understanding of, for example, Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis or have some level of understanding of B.F. Skinner's theory of operant conditioning, which really involves the, the usage of rewards uh, and punishment to motivate or to discourage a particular behavior. So last, uh, perhaps I would like to say is that industrial designers uh, often operate uh, in teams and we often consult uh, psychologists as well. Right, to obtain a better understanding of the situation before we synthesize. And therefore, we can uh, translate these insights into much more tangible yet grounded propositions. So to, your answer, to answer your question, I would say it's just enough. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's a, a great answer. <laughs> um, is, is anybody else out there? Can we, have we got any audio from any of the other? Susie, I wonder if it would help um, if I talk to you a little bit about an example of a project I've been working on um, in, in the area of behaviour change. Um, as well as working for Make Studios, I also work um, as Chief Eco Innovation Officer at a social enterprise called Street. Um, Street helps young people who need a hand with life skills and job readiness training in hospita hospitality and also horticulture but we're also really dedicated to helping to create a healthy planet. So as part of that, back in 2019, we ran a campaign called September. So it's a bit different to some of the amazing um, products that um, some of the other panelists have talked about a little while ago. It was more about um, thinking about how could we change sustainable behaviours um, around reducing single use coffee cups. Um, in Australia, the average um, usage of um, reusable cups it, it has been historically about 5 to 7%, and we wanted to actually change that up quite a bit. So we created a campaign where we looked at um, changing the environment, first of all, so that was um, creating a cup loan scheme for some of our cafes um, that customers um, from the general public um, access. Um, we also looked at closed loop systems um, in some of the buildings that we work in where people could actually take a cup and, and keep it within the building that they're in and somebody would collect it. We also looked at gamification where we had some friendly rivalry across different cafes um, and we used tiny habits, which is helping people to um, create little habits um, that help them remember their reusable cup. Um, it's a methodology created by um, BJ Fogg who is, um, is a behavioural scientist at Stanford University. Um, so we use that as well. And we had a goal of getting up to 33% um, of reusable cups from our average of about 17%. And we managed to achieve that 33%. That was up until the pandemic um, started and we had to sort of um, put that on hold for a bit. But it was actually really, really um, interesting to be able to test out our nudges and um, behaviour design changes um, in real life and, and measure how, how, how effective they were. You created um, last year um, for Design Trust's exhibition in Hong Kong. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Last year, we actually took part in this um, a design uh, exhibition in Hong Kong and we designed a 
a shared chopstick uh, summary. Uh, the, the reason is that we think uh, during the epidemic, uh, not only in the, the epidemic, but even before the epidemic, uh, Chinese people used to share their meals uh, with chopsticks, and uh, it's rather hard to um, to push for the habit of the uh, uh, using public or shared uh, chopsticks, uh, which means there's a uh, chopsticks that uh, you only use for pick up the meals from the table rather than put in your mouth. Um, and that is why uh, a lot of um, stom stomach and um, digestion diseases uh, it has much higher percentage among Chinese population uh, than the other part of the city, uh, of the world. And this COVID-19 uh, epidemic only addressed the emergency uh, of uh, really changing the behavior that people uh, sitting around the table. And so there were uh, very good efforts uh, to <coughs> pushing around uh, the uh, using a shared uh, chopsticks. Um, but um, we noticed that it's really hard to uh, push that and uh, promote it. And because when you're sitting around the table and uh, the the shared chopsticks is always uh, easy to be mixed up with your uh, your own chopsticks, and it's really hard and embarrassing culturally to remind your guest to using it. Uh, so we feel that it'll probably be a better way to uh, guide people uh, through a more interesting way by putting a pair of chopsticks around the uh, the table and make it really interesting and attracting their attention. Uh, that is why we designed the uh, uh, chopsticks samurai, uh, which will stand on the table, uh, rotating around uh, with the dishes, and people can easily uh, pick up and targeting um, the, uh, the the meals. And uh, when you re when you use it, it's very easy and comfortable for you to put it back. And I think the uh, the, the the exhibition got a very good uh, feedback, and we are actually um, uh, commercializing it. And now uh, we are starting to sell it in uh, Hong Kong, and we are also uh, talking to uh, some vendors in within mainland China. I think this, again, uh, I'll come back to my uh, cultural issue. Actually, the behavior is the essence of a culture. Uh, sharing around the table is the culture of uh, all Chinese um, ethnic, ethnic group. Uh, without giving up their culture, but uh, by carefully manipulate their uh, device of the behavior uh, will hopefully shape the uh, society uh, in in a better future. Uh, I think that somehow uh, answer the first question uh, uh, Susie has uh, has mentioned. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's such a, a brilliant and simple solution to, um, you know, some need. Um, you know, I think it's it's wonderful what you've created. And I wanted to address another question to you, actually, because up until now, we've talked mostly about product design and maybe some simple solutions that um, are devised through graphics or user interface. but I also wanted to talk about architecture because I think the spaces that we inhabit also have the power to change our behaviour. Um, and there was a study that I read about just this week, actually, that the US Army did. It was an experiment with four model homes. And each of the behaviours of the residents in those four homes differed quite greatly. Now, the four homes um, had very different energy ratings. They went from uh, 
very inefficient in terms of energy usage, um, all the way to the other extreme of highly efficient, as in zero use of energy. Now, the surprising outcome was that the zero use house, they the residents actually used the most amount of power, whereas in the least if energy efficient home, um, they actually used the least amount of power. And the outcome of that was that actually it was human behavior that was the driver of the energy usage. The people living in the energy efficient home, or the most energy efficient home, um, were assuming that they could do whatever they want and they almost forgot about their behavior and their habits and were wasting a lot of energy um, because of that. Whereas in the least energy efficient home, um, they were much more conscious of their behavior and their energy usage and therefore used the least amount. Um, now, you know, Lifu, I would love to have you talk a little bit about how we can create spaces and buildings that can change the behavior of the inhabitants in a positive way um, that can, you know, obviously have a great impact on the environment. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, to come on that uh, issue because, after all, I'm an architect. I deal with buildings much more than uh, I deal with the, uh, the the devices or industrial product. Uh, definitely, uh, I think the weird thing is that whenever you buy an iPhone or you buy a product, do come with uh, introduction of how to use it, <laughs> but you never got an introduction of how to use your home and uh, you just don't you just don't get it and um, you just use it uh, whatever ways as you like and people think that it's they are entitled to use their buildings or use their home as whatever they wish uh, so i think um, there is always uh, uh, differentiations between how the buildings were designed and uh, how they are intended to be designed to be used versus how the users actually use it um, so I, I think there will be um, like in your example there will be definitely uh, very surprising or unsurprising uh, outcome because the uh, the central element of a building is actually its user, uh, how you use it. If you just throw your iPhone into the water, uh, definitely, you know, you just can cannot complain about uh, it, it, it will get uh, wrecked, right? But when you are using a building, I think it's the same way. Uh, so uh, I think the um, architecture uh, well, no, some, so many times architecture been considered to be something that um, um, distance from the users, people uh, addressing on the, how beautiful it is and how advanced the technical uh, used and uh, uh, to their users, they might change their future usage of that beauty. Um, and as a, another, uh, if we extend this example to the city, to all the other buildings, I think uh, really it's important to educate it, uh, people of how a building could be correctly used. Uh, and also on the other hand, uh, the design has to be more inclusive of uh, people's behavior rather than um, design in a, in a very ideal way, but ignoring the diversity of human being and uh, all the defections of human behavior. So I think this is a, a double way we have to take care of. You've raised so many great points there. I mean, I could not agree more. I would love to see buildings come with a user manual. That's uh, that's such a great idea. Um, I wonder, Fiona, do you have uh, any comments on, on what Lee Fu just said? Yeah, I, I agree with um, Lee Fu. I, I couldn't agree more about the, the, the manual idea as well. And I would add to that, um, I guess when I, I think about um, 
the designing of spaces to help with from an environmental perspective you know um people for any behavior to happen it's a combination of motivation and ability and there's also the interplay between you know cognitive um conscious conscious things that you're aware of and unconscious things that just uh, um are actually unconscious things that you do and um, in designing spaces, there's obviously the environment in, and there's a, a great um, a person in Australia called Jost Baker who has created an amazing environmentally friendly house. And it actually includes everything from having yabbies in the, back, in the backyard. They've got sort of a way that you can fish your own food and um, it's very, very environment, environmentally friendly. So it would almost be impossible not to actually behave in a way that would be really positive for the environment. But when you've got in, when you've got choice there and conscious choice, sometimes um, I think that it's really important to actually integrate elements um, that are available to people from a conscious perspective. And it kind of touches on the idea of the user manual um, that Leafu talked about. Um, in that, if you could actually start to provide information to people um, within an environment, so. If you have a device and you're um, able to actually see how much energy it uses and also potentially see how much energy other houses are using so that you can actually compare yourself um, to, to other environments, those are potentially ways that you could look at, um, you know, potentially creating an environment where you're helping people make good choices. And you mentioned gamification a little bit earlier, Fiona. Do you think that that could potentially come into this Yes, I do. I definitely think gamification. Um, there's actually some really, there's a person called Peter Hirschberg who, who did a whole bunch of um, gamification in, I think he did some in Singapore actually as well, where he looked at using AR so you could actually um, hold up your device and see the energy consumption on different buildings. And he was able to successfully show that if you could actually see how well your building was doing compared to other buildings in terms of energy efficiency, it actually, um, or energy usage, I should say, um, he found that it actually made a difference to people's consumption. So there are ways that it has been used before. And I know it might seem that it would only suit a, one, you know, um, maybe people who are more tech savvy, but there are also ways of including gamification that are very analog as well um, where you actually start for people you start to design things so that people can see um, you know what other people are doing and they can start to compare themselves and have friendly competitions yeah I imagine the world would be a very different place if it became fun to save energy and to, um, to do other things that benefited the environment um, you know, we, we've had we've touched on a number of points, but we haven't actually really kind of gotten to the COVID-19 thing yet, which is obviously, um, I think, the context to the exhibition of Visions of the Future. Uh, and, and Kevin, two of your works specifically relate to the pandemic. Um, one, not so specifically, and you issues that you've addressed in your work um, existed before COVID-19, but perhaps were you know, maybe exacerbated or accelerated because of the pandemic. Um, I, I think I'd like to talk a bit about COVID-19 and, and how it's, um, or actually I wouldn't, I'm tired of talking about it, I'm sure everybody is, but we should, we should discuss it. Um, I think we should talk about how it's changing our behaviours um, and which new or different behaviours you've noticed within yourself and perhaps um, your community. Um, Kevin, do, do you want to maybe, if you can hear me, Apart from sanitation, COVID-19 has definitely changed the way we communicate and the way we conduct business. So for example, during the very early stages of Circuit Breaker uh, in Singapore, um, there was a noticeable increase in the creation of online businesses and entrepreneurial <laughs> endeavors, and as well as contactless transactions. Um, of course, I think the change that I see myself I see in myself and some of my colleagues is that we start to pay an extra attention to our health and exercise. Uh, while the initial thought is that exercising outdoors gives us an excuse, right, during the circuit breaker or during the lockdown, um, the term that's used uh, in some other countries, right, that nudge eventually motivated the formation of healthy habits, which tend to stick after about 30 days or so, and then people start to to continue to exercise. So that is something that I saw, right? The change that I saw in myself. 
even after the lockdown or the circuit breaker uh, was lifted. Yeah, interesting. What about you, uh, Yun Ru? Maybe for me, I will talk a bit about like how COVID kind of influenced the way we interact with our environment. Because clearly, this is the period where um, it's encouraged as little physical interaction as possible with our environment. And we became more conscious about everything we touch when we are in public places. And to me, I feel sense of touch is kind of an important role in the way we perceive our environment. So I find it becoming more um, like an interesting challenge to consider if there is any design alternative that can serve or make up for the void created by our reliance on touch. And through my project, I also realized that the physical sensation and physical contact with things and people strongly influence the way we remember things and the way events are captured in our memory. And as such, like as we are forced to reduce interaction with others and things around us, how will we remember the world um, change? And also in the future, will certain things kind of be a bit um, obsolete? Because for example, like will people in the future still use or remember red packet because especially um at, for this situation now the way e ang baos are being encouraged during chinese new year i think it's interesting to also consider like which culture will weaken and strengthen or even evolve as a result you were just saying about the uh, the differences between what you'd observed in china and the us do you want to continue yeah i definitely think this is a perfect example of how the behavior shaped uh, society in uh, uh, certain uh, circumstances. And uh, I think culturally, Chinese people are much more disciplined and uh, following the um, whatever the authorities uh, direction is. And they stay and they stay at home and they keep on the mask. And uh, then when I landed in the uh, Los Angeles, I feel like, you know, uh, I'm the only person in pan uh, paranoid. And uh, <laughs> so I stay there and since nothing happened um, to everybody else. And uh, I, even though the, the news channels talk about how many people died, uh, but since nobody really cares, <laughs> then I, come back to China and I, you know, I stay there since then. I feel like in this kind of circumstances, uh, the, the behavior uh, of individuals uh, following the uh, instruction is much more better off than just follow your heart. So, so in China, actually, we, we are almost back to normal uh, for most of the rest of that year, but it seems that in the uh, in US, the uh, they're starting to uh, turn back to normal after the vaccine comes out. So I think that definitely is an example of how the behavior behavior of individuals can shape the uh, the, the the situation of the whole uh, society. Um, well, again, that that's about culture. I think, I believe, different country have different cultures, and uh, part of them is somehow uh, embedded in everybody's behavior. So, um, yeah, that's my observation. I really couldn't agree more. I had been in Hong Kong. Uh, and landed in Australia last March, the beginning of design week. And uh, agree, I completely agree. I think I was the only one wearing a face mask and was quite shocked to see how um, seemingly blase Australia was about all of this. So Fiona, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, um, you know, changing changes in behavior in Australia um, since and through the pandemic. Have you noticed anything specific that you'd like to share? 
like, as you as you've just said, um, we were very slow um, to, to get off the mark with wearing masks in Australia, um, and in, and as well, we were getting advice, I guess, from medical experts to tell us that it was advisable not to wear masks. And it was only um, it took quite some time um, for us to really get on board and understand how important they were. Um, but like many people, while I thought that it would be a good idea to wear a mask, I also know I struggled personally going to the supermarket, for example, thinking on the one hand it would actually be a really good idea to wear a mask and on the other hand, um, you know, wondering if I'm going to bump into a neighbour who thinks that I'm just going overboard where the, when the advice wasn't very clear. And um, at the cafes that we have as well, we had to start to think about what we were going to do and we decided to implement masks um, mask wearing in our cafes, um, but this was before the government had mandated them. And um, fortunately, very very shortly after we'd made that decision, um, the Victorian government mandated them. And I think that actually that was a tipping point for us in Australia. I think, or in Victoria, I should say, um, the people started to gladly wear them. Um, or a large proportion of people started to gladly wear them when it became, you know, something that was that was mandated. Um, so it really did change things. And I know for myself, I actually, um, knowing that it's really important to have a good Uber rating, I would normally be reluctant to sort of challenge too much when it comes to being in an Uber. Um, but with with COVID, I um, felt it was really important to make sure and insist that the driver was wearing a mask as well as myself, um, and also to have the window wide open um, to get the ventilation happening. So I think we've come a long way in Victoria. I would say some of our other states are less less um, uh, inclined to wear masks, and it's a lot to do with the, gov the government and policy, I think. Yeah, absolutely. But I think Melburnians, having gone through one of the longest lockdowns in the world, um, have probably had a, a great deal of their behaviours changed, um, <laughs> whether they like it or not. Um, so I think I'm going to move to our last question. I know that we've everyone's been incredibly patient and persistent this evening um, with these uh, intermittent tech issues. So I don't want to keep everyone too late. Um, so my last question for each of you is about you know what you see the future of behavioural design. Um, being where that might move to and whether there may be any ethical issues. Um, I know Fiona you had perhaps some thoughts on that um, and or if there was anything that you were working on that might be of interest that is incorporating behavioural design. So maybe Fiona if you'd like to talk a bit maybe about the ethics of behavioural design. Yeah. Sure. Um, yes, I think um, ethics is becoming, as I mentioned at the very beginning, really, really important um, and people are becoming way more aware of that. There's, um, I don't know if people have heard of the, the agitator and designer Mike Montero who mentions that, you know, as designers we have an obligation or we're respons we take responsibility for what we design and the effect of what we design and I guess three areas that are really important for that is to think about um, the goals um, that we're trying to achieve through designing um, and, and making behaviour change. Is it for the actual person or is it for um, somebody else, um, for the general public, or is it actually manipulating people? So um, in thinking about what a nudge is, is it, um, and I know Richard Thaler talks about that as nudge versus sludge, um, sludge being when it's actually manipulating people. Um, it's a very fine line there sometimes between what is actually um, helping somebody and what is um, what is actually, um, you know, being manipulative. And I guess it really is, in my mind, about um, doing what's helpful for the person and the general public. Um, the second thing is autonomy. Do we, by creating um, nudges and behavioural interventions, are we actually, um, are we doing things that people aren't aware of um, and the, the taking away their autonomy? And um, are we also sort of um, reducing their, their ability to think for themselves in the long run. You know, if everything becomes automatic and a nudge, does that mean that people are left with, um, they don't get as much practice as they should um, in making their own decisions about things? And the third thing is the effect. You know, are we um, actually, when we're, when we're creating behaviour change, are we actually getting the impact that we want? Are, are the nudges that we're putting in place effective? Uh, and also, are they um, creating unintended negative consequences? So an example of that might be the exercise trackers where, um, you know, they're intended to help motivate people and get people to exercise more. But there's actually a lot of evidence that an unintended consequence of um, exercise trackers is that if people don't meet their 10,000 steps a day or whatever goals that they have, it can actually um, 
they, they actually sort of lose motivation and stop exercising as much as one example. That's a lot of food for thought there. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I wonder, Li Fu, do you have anything to add? Is there anything, uh, you know, aside from creating a, a user's manual for buildings or cities, is there anything else that you'd like to see happen in the future in the realm of behavioural design or anything that you're working on that's mm -hmm. incorporating that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think the uh, the, beh the behavior design uh, can be guided on either end. Uh, ethnic uh, ethnic uh, issue definitely is part of the uh, bottom lines we are talking about here, and I'm doing a lot actually in my uh, architectural career. Uh, I'm designing a lot of. Uh, retail or the mixed use projects. Uh, I work for developers a lot. And I think some of the uh, behavioral uh, design can be used in making the city a better place and make it uh, more, uh, give it more energy. But on the same time, on the other hand, uh, many times the uh, behavioral design were abused. Uh, to become so profit uh, center and to make people addictive to certain behavior in order to make money out of it. And I think, uh, especially in the uh, commercial world uh, and in the uh, gaming world and in the, um, uh, the uh, gaming industry, uh, so many people and so many, especially young kids, uh, just cannot uh, escape from the uh, addiction to their electric gadgets. And um, I think that's a perfect example of how behavior design uh, being abused uh, in order to create um, profit for the enterprise and for the capital. Um, so I think as architects, I think on the on the one hand we will still uh, trying to make the um, uh, behavioral design a good tool uh, to energize people and energize the city. Um, and on the other hand, actually, I think we uh, um, we have this responsibility uh, to make a real world more attractive uh, to the young people and the kids. Um, so that we are actually competing with, uh, in terms of architecture and the physical space, we are competing with the uh, virtual gadgets. Um, we are trying to create more interesting places for people to hang out and to chat and to meet person by person rather than uh, uh, addictive to the virtual world. Uh, one project actually I'm working on, we have just finished this. So what you, we used re, recycled uh, inner tire uh, from the, um, of the rubber inner tire to create jumping beds as a playground uh, for kids. And it was quite success, successful. It's an uh, it, uh, installation in uh, UABB, uh, Shenzhen uh, Piano uh, in China. Shanghai, um, and the, the exhibition is already over and uh, we will actually uh, cooperate with some other camping sites and uh, some other uh, entrepreneurs to make them uh, available for the campers and for the families and uh, kids. And I think by making the physical world more interesting and more attractive, uh, is one way that we can do uh, to uh, compete uh, with the uh, addiction to uh, the commercial and to the uh, electric gadgets. Um, uh, I think uh, that's uh, something we are uh, trying to uh, test right now. Um, well, I love the sound of that. I. You know, I think that that's such a wonderful um, field of inquiry to make the real world so great that we don't need to be lost in our phones. Thanks, Kevin. Do you want to share anything with us? Well, I guess uh, 
more about the work that I'm currently pursuing, right? Um, I am currently looking into how the usage of very simple healthcare technology, essentially it's just a surface and when you run the current through it, you can drop the temperature of that surface or you can increase the temperature of that surface. And I'm using that as a basis to conduct a simple research to understand um, how by introducing that temperature change in our ears, uh, we are able to actually change our perception of heat and therefore help us better cope uh, in heat waves, which is definitely a phenomenon that's getting uh, much more frequent and much more intense. Uh, I guess another sort of the project that I'm looking into, it's sort of changing the perceptions of what people have of food waste. So for example, um, I'm currently looking at cosmetically filtered food produce and the potential applications of this food produce. So either as cosmetics, for example, um, it may sound ironic, but it is in a way a poetic interpretation of beauty and how um, we sort of acknowledge the fact that you know, these are discarded, but eventually we are able to use it for ourselves to make our looks better, to make our look better, right? Um, I guess the last point regarding the future of behavioral design. On the more optimistic note, uh, I would say that the basis of behavioral design will definitely extend beyond just looking at people, but rather also at other living things and our environment. It, I believe that it will be used as a tool to help us decode the world that we know so that we can better anticipate uh, the changes to come. So just to give an example, understanding the behavior changes in bees can help to predict crop harvest, right? Since bees are very uh, key players to, that help to pollinate food crops. So I believe that would be the shift to having behavior design just studying people to extending that scope to studying other living things. Thanks, Kevin. They all sound really interesting. And I think, uh, you know, anything in particular related to global warming is, is only going to be a very um, fruitful field of inquiry. While we're waiting for Yunru to come back online, um, I'd really like to encourage all of you that are watching tonight to visit the Visions of the Future uh, exhibition. It will be online until the end of March. Um, Kevin and Yunru are two of um, several de young designers from Singapore whose work is on show in the exhibition. And you may know the website already. That's probably how you're watching the live stream. But in case it's not, um, please visit the website. It is visionsofthefuture.sg. Um, and yeah, please read up. Each of the designers are uh, equally accomplished and thoughtful, um, and I'm sure have a, a very bright future ahead of each of them. Um, Yun Ru, are you there? So please tell us what you're working on and any fields of inquiry that you've got coming up. Okay, so I think for me, I'm more looking to see how my project will evolve. Um, so I'm planning to see how I could push my project into like an open source website in which people could download and 3D print the device in the future, making it more accessible for everyone or even the users. Um, to be able to contribute to the constant development of the product. Um, yeah, so I, I'm also interested to explore and focus on creating more meaningful designs that suit smaller productions and um, how it can diversify into many alternative manufacturing processes that are able to fit the needs of niche market rather than mass producing for all. Yeah. Sounds great. You well, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I speak for all of us in that we're very much looking forward to seeing what both of you have um, coming up next. So I think that is all that we have time for this evening. I want to say thank you to each of you for your patience and for your perseverance and for everyone that's watching for your patience as well. And I hope you've all stayed um, online and, and watched us through to the end. Um, so thank you, a big thank you to Po Yun Ru, Kevin Chiam, Fiona Mian and Li Fu for joining us and for your time, for your insights and your expertise. It's been a really interesting discussion despite the technical difficulties of uh, connecting four countries, three countries. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you all.